If you caught my direct message last week, you heard me explain why we shouldn't let politics make us crazy, yet the crazy seems to be ramping up everywhere you look these days. This constant onslaught of political bickering has an incredibly polarizing effect on most people. The fighting either makes them obsessively tune into politics nonstop or reflexively tune out of politics altogether. With so much news and commentary content out there, if you give me an hour or two of your week to hear about political science, philosophy, religion, or anything else we're discussing here, I consider the time you spend with me to be a pretty high honor. Those of you who follow me on social media outside of YouTube probably saw that I spent last week on a farm with family and friends outside of Seattle. Though I spent most of the week hanging out with 20 chickens and one duck who thinks she's a chicken, I had a couple personal experiences with actual real life human beings which reminded me why these aren't just abstract ideas that we talk about here. One of the people on the farm with us was a trans woman in her 20s who happened to grow up on a pot farm. She was also an avid hunter and a guns rights enthusiast who was painting her gun locker bright blue and pink at the time of our visit. Yes, trans women are sometimes into guns, but if you judge people as a collective instead of as an individual, this is exactly the type of person who will always go ignored. I also spent some time with a farmer who lived almost 100% off his own land, but he was very concerned with treating other people fairly and making sure that others had the same opportunity to succeed, which he had. While his day-to-day -day life had a very libertarian bent to it because he provided for himself and was living off the land, there was no doubt that he wanted there to be assistance for people so that they could one day share in the same opportunity and pride in work that he himself had attained. His live and let live attitude was blended with his desire to do good for others in his community. He was a far cry from what some would say about those selfish libertarians or what others might say about those authoritarian lefties. While I was away, I also had a truly awe-inspiring hike up Mount Rainier, which is part of the U.S. National Park Service. This park is an incredible example of a natural wonder that we have right here in this country, which happens to be funded and protected by the federal government. You guys all know that I'm a small government guy and I'd always prefer local and state funding, but a place like Mount Rainier, which is so gorgeous and so powerful, I believe, should have some federal funding. And I'd say the same, by the way, for a place like Yellowstone National Park or Yosemite. The question here is how much funding or the best way to pay for this funding. That's really what the debate is about. By the way, Mount Rainier is also funded by state and local organizations, and I met many great people along the trail who are volunteering their time and energy to a place they love so much. That right there is called putting your beliefs into action, not just demanding that the government pay for something with other people's money, which is often what we talk about. My point here is that people are complex, issues are complex, and finding answers which will satisfy everyone almost always is absolutely impossible. At the same time, not only do we all have our own strengths and passions, but we all also have our own inconsistencies and blind spots. Our goal shouldn't be about purity tests so that people fall in line or adhere to some false notion of perfection. Our goal should be the acknowledgement of differences so we stand up for the freedom and for the liberty that this country was founded upon. Joining me today is an author, a commentator, a screenwriter, and a pilot. Bill Whittle, welcome to the Rubin Report. Good to be here, Dave. Took long enough. It did take long Considering enough. Considering the distance we had to travel to get here. I had no idea. I don't want to give it away, anything away related to our location. We will but not. It, we it, we it are in two, und two undisclosed locations that are probably 400 yards apart from each other, something like that. Yeah, completely ridiculous. Yeah, ridiculous. And there is a food place, which we're not going to describe, where later we could possibly break bread. Sweet. It wouldn't necessarily be bread we were breaking there. It would be... We can't, careful. I don't want to say anything else. Uh, all right, I'm looking forward to talking to you. I was on your show a couple weeks ago. We yeah, had a great, a great discussion about the things that I really care about, about freedom, about liberty, about how we should be governed, about ways that we shouldn't be governed, and, and all sorts of other stuff. And especially about the idea that people should not only should be allowed to, but, but the entire thesis of this country is disagreement, right? I mean, that's the entire reason we're here. We should be able to discuss things. I, I think I said on the show, and I certainly mean it, when somebody makes a case that's compelling enough for me, I'll change my mind and I feel a bigger person. You know, I feel, I feel like I come out of that larger. Yeah, so, all right, so let's start right there. Mm -hmm. What happened? What went wrong seemingly in the last couple years 
where sitting down from someone that you disagree with and agreeing to disagree or just not agreeing to disagree but going, okay, I can still live in the country with that person. What, where did that go? Where did that start crumbling? When did it start crumbling? Well, first of all, I think, I think there's, you could probably make the case that in terms of uh, what the other side doesn't like, you, you kind of started this pendulum and rather than the pendulum damping out, it's just gotten wider and wider and wider, right? So, so you know, there's, uh, there's Reagan and they didn't like Reagan, so Bill Clinton and conservatives didn't like Clinton and then George Bush and liberals <laughs> and then Barack Obama and now Donald Trump is just things just gonna, the building's gonna come apart. But I think the primary thing that's changed is that politics is in so much more of our life than it used to be. Seems to me that uh, I didn't know I didn't know if my dad was a Republican or a Democrat until I was probably 20, hmm. 18, 19, 20. I just didn't care, and I didn't think about politics in any way, shape, or form until I was 43. So all of um, all of the things that used to be political were not things that you'd get particularly ginned up about. You know, somebody's going to make a, a, a trade agreement with China, and if your neighbor thinks it should be 13 percent, you, and you're one of the 24 percent people, you're not likely to lose Thanksgiving dinners over those things. Right. But as politics has pressed itself out into everything else in the entire culture, now everything is political. And you find yourself on these, um, on these sides of issues, and sometimes, occasionally, you find yourself arguing against things that you actually kind of support just because, you know, it's coming from the other team and, and it's, it's getting really out of hand. Yeah, so you weren't political no, until no, you no. were 43, yeah. which is really fascinating yeah. and I want to get to that. But that you didn't know that whether your father was a Democrat or Republican is kind of interesting. Tell me a little bit about growing up. Well, um, my dad was a hotel manager. I was born in Manhattan and um, we lived just across the river in uh, in West New York, just a couple hundred yards from where uh, Aaron Burr won that altercation. Ah. And um, just before my fourth birthday, we moved to Bermuda. So I grew up in Bermuda. And uh, I actually kind of grew up in the best corner of Bermuda. I mean, my, my dad was pretty solidly middle class. I don't think, he, I was quite shocked as an adult when I found out he never made more than $44,000 a year. Really, it was really quite a shock for me. Mm. But there were a lot of great perks with it. And um, growing up on the pink beaches of Bermuda was pretty nice. But the main thing about that experience was uh, the British schools, which are, were, anyway, exceptional, extraordinary. They were uh, highly disciplined, very structured, but they were also very competitive, very competitive. And I just took to that. And, um, and it gave me I don't know, a four or five year boost in terms of education, but socially, it was probably a five-year anchor. You know, right. so, you know, it was an all-boys school. So suddenly you arrive in Miami and you're fearing for your life and you got this funny accent and you don't carry your book right, you know, and yeah, so, so it, it, was, uh, it was a real transformative experience for me. And then what took you another 23-ish years to get into politics? Well, I, um, I had seen the Thunderbirds. I, I, my dad was a very busy man because a hotel manager is a day job and a night job. Yeah. He used to run the hotel during the day, came home, take an hour or two, nap, and then go down and entertain the, the, the guests. So he took me to see the Thunderbirds out at uh, Kinley Air Force Base in 65, I guess, flying F-100s, and I just dropped my ice cream cone and I never really picked it up, you know? <laughs> I mean, honestly, I was, what? So um, between the ages of five and 17, I was just, I was just gonna go, I was gonna be an astronaut. I was serious about it. I got a job at the Miami Planetarium when I was 13, I think. And I was running shows and teaching astronomy there from 14 and everything's looking good. And I went to take the vision test as part of the physical and sailed through everything else. And I didn't even know I had a vision problem wow. until I failed the vision test. And that was it. That was it. And uh, needless to say, I spent the, that summer between junior and senior year in college, just wandering around like a somebody had been clubbed on the head, you know. I didn't leave the house for like a yeah, long time. Yeah, that, that must be, I mean, I didn't know exactly what I no, wanted was to do. I, I sometimes still, I don't know exactly what I want to do, but I can only imagine being, what, 17, is that what you said? That's right. And, and suddenly your dreams are crushed by something that you simply cannot control. Yeah, and I'd been after these for quite a long time. Yeah. But uh, that, that's exactly, and, and by the way, that's a really interesting point because that aspect of my life has, has, has been a big influence on a lot of the political thinking I do. That, that idea that, you know, that, that nobody, that the world did not owe me the Air Force Academy, the world didn't owe me a uh, Mars mission, all the things I thought I was gonna do, it didn't owe those things to me. Uh, I was heartbroken by it, but th that's the way it goes. And, and, and parenthetically, just very quickly, what I did find out about life is that, you know, you can't always get what you want, but sometimes, you know, 
try real hard, you can get what you need, right? So, so I didn't. I think there's a song about that. If no, I'm I suspect mistaken. I made Somebody that up. No, that. no, I'm certainly, I'm, I'm quite certain I came up with that line. <laughs> um, but, but so I, you know, I wanted to fly uh, F-16s, and I can't fly F-16s, and I never will. But I have a little experimental. Um, airplane with a propeller in the back so I don't have to see it and I go through the air at 200 miles an hour and I make my fighter pilot turns and and it's good enough so that is the pilot that I mentioned earlier yeah that's a big part of my personality and um, but it's a it's a really interesting point for me because there's very few people in life who I think get exactly what they want but if you are dealt cards that prevents that you can still get pretty close I know that I mean the number of people that play uh, NBA basketball as a percentage of the population. Is, as you can see where I would rather be than here. Exactly. Probably the only place that I'd rather exactly. be than here would be if I could be in the NBA. Okay, so you don't get a chance to play in the NBA, and that's the cards you're dealt with, and there's nothing you can do about that. But you do get to play basketball, and if you really, really like playing basketball, you could play league basketball with guys that are really, really good, and it's, it's, it's enough. It is for me anyway. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, that's what it's all about, right? Sort of going as hard as you can, but then realizing where the limits might be and then figuring out how to max that out, whatever that means to you, in joy and skill or, or anything yeah. else. I, I learned uh, very late also, probably only three or four years ago, somebody told me that the, um, that the ancient Greek definition of happiness was using all of your abilities to their fullest. And I thought, that's really true. Yeah. You know, you know, you know when you're doing good work, and you know when you're doing bad work, but you know when you're doing good work, and, and when you do things that, that you put a lot of effort into, and especially when you work really hard for, for goals for a long period of time, uh, it's, there's no feeling like it. It's, it's, the reason, it's the reason that makes me feel human. You know? Yeah, that would be a good segue to where I want to go in a little bit about sure. you know, building your own thing and having your own platform mm -hmm. and doing this on your own outside of mainstream. We're gonna get there, but I want to hear about this 43-year-old episode what happened you're 43 years old yeah you're doing your thing well but and then I, suddenly uh, well the, the Air Force thing happened between my junior and senior year in college and I had some friends basically took pity on me and they dragged me out into the Florida summer and we started making super 8 movies and it gave me a chance to do a little clowning around and I guess I was just a natural ham and, those, and stuff certainly looking at most of my videos I realize that's probably putting it mildly yeah uh, but I, it was actually fun and and we took it real seriously. We did, we did a lot of uh, stories and, and, and cuts, and you know, we didn't just turn on the camera. We took it like real movies. And then I realized that uh, when I went for my senior year in high school, that uh, all, the, all the girls who had, uh, who had wanted nothing to do with Mr. Calculator on his belt, turtleneck in the Florida summer, you know, <laughs> science dork, yeah. all of a sudden you're making movies, everybody wants to be in them, you know, and you're getting invited to parties, and people are saying, hey, you're actually kind of funny. It's like, yeah, it's funny last year, too. Uh, and, and so there was that it reward. Was the turtleneck in Florida, dude. You have no idea. Ridiculous. You don't even the start calculator, me. Fine. Don't, don't even start me. It's all part of the. It's all part of the uh, outer shell of vanity that that, that makes my life uh, what it is. But 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 truthfully, I mean, it was, it was, when I say it was a role, it it was an identity, and and it was very important to me. And then I became a theater major at the University of Florida. A friend of mine who's a year older, who was making the movies, just goofing around, went to the University of Florida, got a degree in theater. He said, you can come up, spend a weekend with them. And I said, you can actually do this for, you can you get a degree in this? Yeah, you yeah. get financial aid too. <laughs> well, damn. You know, so I was a theater major. And I was very left-wing, I would say, very left-wing. And over time, I just, I just started reading all kinds of other different things. And it never was really a moment. So I was, I was considered a, a Republican by the people I was working with, but I didn't know much about anything. 9-11 uh, turned a lot of people, but it didn't turn me. What turned me was right after 9-11, about nine months later, my dad died and he was interred at Arlington, which is shocking because he was never a war hero, he was never shot at. He got to Germany in the last week of the war, I think. But I found myself out there on an October morning. I've never been that cold in my life. And, and you're walking the rows of Arlington, and all of the headstones are exactly the same. And here's a major general who's been in you know, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Gulf. You know, war. Here's a guy who, just do the math, he's a sergeant. Maybe he was in the, less than a year, maybe. And this was in October of 2002 when a lot of the pushback was starting. Oh, we deserve 9-11. It was our fault. You know? mm -hmm. And I just remember thinking that, my dad, who had been such a, such an asset as a businessman, over time, he just basically, you know, got fired on the phone. But 40, 
40 some years after he signed on the dotted line along with everybody else you know they turn out here's 20 guys in the army uh, band here's another 20 guys in the army honor guard and the case on and everything it's freezing cold these guys are at attention they're the same age as he was when he signed on the dotted line and i thought a country that keeps its promises like that that keeps those fundamental promises is is uh, is worth defending so I, I wrote a, 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 just a very brief two-page thing to a guy whose blog I admired very much at the time, a guy named Stephen Denbest. And he said, do you mind if I print this? And I, okay, sure. And, and got a lot of attention and did something else that got attention. And Rachel Lucas set me up with a, with a blog. And I started a blog called Eject, Eject, Eject. And I didn't write about politics at all. I wrote about philosophy and I wrote about morality. I wrote, it got to be an affectation, I guess, but... I wrote uh, essays called um, Courage and Responsibility, Power, um, Honor, Freedom, History, those kind of things. Yeah. And big, it, well, it, big issues. It's interesting to me because when I was on your show just a couple weeks ago, we did, we did a full hour and there, we didn't prepare before. You didn't question me before, but I knew that, you know, we've met a couple times and I knew that, we're, you know, we were having a good conversation. But we barely talked politics in the traditional sense. I mean, right. We did a little more of this, where we're talking about the ideas around politics that sort of frame it. That's that's always what I'm interested in, and I, I sense that's what you're interested in. So, wh why is that? Why isn't it about the minutia? There's so many people lost, I think, in the minutia of the day-to-day -day politics, screaming about this immediate decision or Trump tweeted this today. Yeah, it's very reactive. And the reaction, yeah, exactly. The reaction to this. I find the only way to make sense of it is to try to care about the stuff that really is the underpinning of it. Absolutely right. And um, and one of the reasons I was looking forward to coming here and talking to you, and, and we did the election night thing as well, is because there's a great deal of that civility gone. Now, people can make a legitimate claim that, you know, I'm advancing the laws of civility because I do a fair number of, um, of videos where I point out things that I don't think that, by the way, Thunderbirds, yeah. just doing a quick flyover. You know, in my, we've done a pretty good quick, job quick of soundproofing. My, no, no, but, no, 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 they, they, I, they, they called it in. They knew I was going to be on, heard the Thunderbird story, you guys are four and a half minutes late. Um, but they, um, it, it's it's about the philosophy and it's about the ability to disagree about things. And and to be honest with you, I'm, I'm ready to talk to anybody uh, who who's ready to make an argument, you know, and, yeah. not, and not just launch all the vitriol. But, but I... I try very, very, very hard to get things right. And before I ever go on camera or do anything, I really do kind of pre-flight these ideas. I kind of walk around and say, what if you're wrong? Are you right about this? Uh, you know, are you, are you, are you cherry-picking data? Are you aware that you might be cherry-picking data without even knowing it? And if I make a spelling mistake, it makes me sick. <laughs> you know, it just, it just makes me ill. Yeah, one of the things that we talked about uh, a couple weeks ago was that I said to you that I've never blatantly lied on this show. That's right. I've, I have made mistakes That's right. without question. We've had times where I've made a, a mistake and I've told my guys after, leave it in, because I want, I'll comment then in the comment section mm -hmm. and say, you know, I screwed this up. Yep. Um, but I want people to see that I'm as human as anyone else and anything. But I would never intentionally mislead or intentionally lie. But even that, See, that seems like such a big thing these days when it, it's it's actually such a small thing. Yeah, and, and that's probably the most the single most uh, common word applied to people in, in in terms of criticism of their politics on YouTube comments or whatever. You know, liar. This lie, 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 lie. I can honestly stand here and tell you, same as you, I have never told a lie on those shows. I, that doesn't mean I've never been wrong. But it means I have never gone out there knowing something was untrue and, and said it as if it was true. Yeah. That goes to so much of what's wrong with mainstream media right yeah. now, which I know you're, we're very much uh, simpatico mm -hmm. on that, on a lot of the mainstream media stuff. So the night that we first met was election night. We were over at the Daily Wire offices mm -hmm. and they had some beers and Shapiro was there and Clavin and a couple other guys. Shapiro was sort of vacillating back and forth between he was thrilled that Hillary wasn't going to be president, but sort of horrified that Trump was going to I, be president. I thought he was vacillating between being really upset that Trump won and being a little bit upset that Trump won. But but yeah, he was he yeah, was so he was out here vibrating. Yeah. However you want to parse yeah, it, it was no, like, no, I had never seen him in that position before. Clavin, I think, was a little, and I had him on a couple weeks ago. He was more okay with Trump, but you were you were elated that night, and you were the first person that I saw, and it was because it was happening that night, and I happened to be in a room with you. You were the first person that I saw that was like, "This is 
this is it, this is what I've wanted. Like, you know, and yeah. I had had Milo on and Cernovich and Scott Adams, other supporters, but I happened to be with you that night. Are you, are you as elated uh, eight months later? Well, I am, but but probably uh, almost certainly for reasons that you that you don't suspect. I wasn't elated that Donald Trump was elected because I was a Donald Trump fan. I was never a Donald Trump fan. When people ask me for the first six months of this thing, what do you like about say one thing you like about Donald Trump? I said I like his hat. You know, pretty much it. Um, and all throughout the debates and so on. And 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 so I was never like a Trump guy. I was a I was a real solid. Um, you know, I was I was a Ted Cruz guy, mm -hmm. but I wasn't elated about the night because Donald Trump won. I was elated about the night because there was still room for choice in the American political system. That that this thing was not on a, a rail. That this media uh, bias was not something that was insurmountable. There still was a chance to get off of the track of history that had been written out for for pretty much the whole country. I didn't think he was going to win. I didn't think it was going to win at all. Mm -hmm. And the main reason I was as happy as I was, to be honest with you, is, um, is because uh, my fiance is from Russia. And when she came uh, over... Well... The fiance is, a, is, a, is an open secret. Yeah. Uh, when she came over here... Russia, yeah, you know... Yeah. But when she came... This before the Russia thing happened, because that'll happen post-election. Two, two nights after the election, Hillary says, fake news, Russia connection, all the rest of it. But she came over from Russia, and... And we went to a debate watching the first debate with a bunch of conservatives here in Los Angeles. There were three of us, I suspect. <laughs> maybe 20, yeah, maybe 20, thin 20 25, thin yeah. group. And in that first debate, Trump was landing these, these, these um, let's not say he was landing any blows, but he was counterattacking with enthusiasm, let's at least put it that way. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, and people were cheering. And, and she looked at me and said, um, why is everybody so excited? I said, because honey, these are, these are important issues. This is really, really important. And it, it was impossible for her to really realize on the spot that we take it as, we, that, we, that there is in fact a choice. There's no politics in Russia, right? The, the, the people don't have any, they don't talk politics in Russia because it doesn't make any difference what your politics are in Russia. Putin's gonna do what he wants to do and that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. The idea that people would have an, an emotional vested interest in the outcome of this meant that the outcome was in doubt. And, and as, the, as the primary went on, and as the, uh, rather as the rest of the election season went on and so on, it just began to look like that kind of headwind was just insurmountable. That the Clinton, uh, you know, the Clinton machine and, 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 and the, the media coverage and everything was just not gonna be possible. But no, he, he was never my candidate. He's not my candidate now, He's, he is, he is to me the only person that is capable of destroying the, the, the media information complex. And what comes with that, I'll take. And it's so interesting that so many people are putting such a high premium on that, including Andrew Clavin, who we were with that night. And one of the things that he said that evening that did help me frame this a little bit more was he said, what a beautiful country we live in that all the pundits could be wrong. Yeah. All of the, the money and the power and the elite, they all said this is gonna happen, all the polls said this is gonna happen, and the reverse happened. That actually shows you the strength of our democracy and the, and the beauty of the power to the people. Absolutely right, and this is my entire theory of, of what, what I try to defend, is, the, is I had, when I was in my 20s and 30s, certainly right after I started making movies and stuff, in college, when I was in college, I was exceedingly unpleasant person. I really was. I was so, I was so obsessed with intelligence. I was so obsessed with you know looking smart, being smart, and and I was so sure of myself. And I had that beaten out of me over the course of you know 25, 30 years, 30 plus years of being a limo driver, a security guard, a waiter, you know all these things. And I got to. I got to be in show business. I came out here as an editor, and I'm hanging around very, you know, sophisticated people and and very beautiful people and and some celebrities and things like that. And I went on a speaking event early in my career, and I'll just tell you the story straight up. I was at a, at an event afterwards. I I make it a point to be the last person out of the room. You know, they're going to fly me out there, and people are going to come and see me. I'm I'm the last guy out. So I was talking to everybody, and and a guy came up to me, 
And honest to God, he looked like Junior Samples from Hee Haw. You know, <laughs> he's a big guy. He was wearing the um, the, the the overalls, you yeah. know, and the coveralls, and the, he just he looked like Junior Samples from Hee Haw. And I had this thought right right then. I thought, you know. It'd be nice if I was a, you know, if I was a leftist and I could get all this kind of, you know, more glamorous people in the Hollywood crowd and the whole, and just flow with the entire pop culture. And then uh, right on the heels of that, it wasn't later anything, just like this lightning bolt, like I'd shocked myself, you know. I remember thinking, dude, this man knows a hundred things more than you do, better than you do, a hundred things he knows better than you do. And there's probably two or three things that this guy knows that make him pretty near an expert in the world. Now, that may be just things like at what temperature milk begins to congeal or whatever. But don't, don't go there. This was an enormous breakthrough for me, and, and it's been something I've tried to keep myself honest with very, very long time and very carefully. It's the idea that there is a reservoir of knowledge in the population of America and that it's not based entirely on education. In fact, it's not based mostly on education. Yeah. It is a fundamental decency and a fundamental sense of what works and what doesn't. And I got tired of those people being demonized. I got tired of them being, um, being assaulted by people with very high rhetorical skill. And, and very good looking on camera and very big loud um, loudspeakers, but I got tired of it. And it doesn't strike me as fair. And, and, I, and I what I learned from this, Dave, is I learned that rhetorical uh, ease and intelligence are not the same thing. They look like they're the same thing to some people, but they're not the same thing, they're different. Yeah, that's so interesting to me because we both were born in New York. Mm -hmm. We both now live in LA. Mm -hmm. And yet I feel what you're saying very intimately. That always became obvious to me when I started interviewing people and I'd start getting emails from people in the middle of the country and they'd say, Dave, it doesn't sound like you're judging us. Everyone else is judging us. And I always think, well, I don't think I'm better than you. I'm somebody just doing the best I can. There you go. And, and that's it. I mean, that's it. I hope I'm bringing some goodness here and trying to do the best I can. Exactly. But, but I don't feel that I have some magic wisdom that they don't have. I think if anything, they might have some magic wisdom that I don't Precisely have. Precisely right, which is, why I, which is why my favorite part of the speaking events is the Q&A, because... Uh, I agree, I, I love the q and By far. Yeah. It, it, first of all, if you can get a question you've never heard before and you can answer it on the fly, yeah. that means you understand your philosophy. Because so many questions you've dealt with before, so you have kind of a canned answer, it's just the only way to think about it. You're yeah. a comedian, you write jokes, if you're a musician, you sing songs, if you're a pundit, you, you have answers to things that you get a lot. But, um, but when I get a question that, I, that literally stumps me, I realize, I, for me personally, I say, well, what's the freedom answer here? What's, what, what is the freedom answer here? Mm -hmm. And that almost always takes me to the right place. And so I enjoy that aspect of it, but I learn so much from the people. And one of the things that I learn a lot from, I don't do many of them, uh, just haven't, but when I go to very liberal schools, I have a very steep learning curve uh, as a result of my interaction with the audience. Which is important, and I suspect you probably enjoy. In the I do. Uh, I'm not wired for patience as a general <laughs> rule. Um, but I had an experience out in um, East Texas this uh, just last winter, and I got to this event, and I started speaking, and uh, I think I might have mentioned, we, we did a whole segment on this, as a matter of fact, and there was a guy in the front row who had started a Facebook page to have me banned from speaking. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I said, if you, know, if you imagine if Trotsky had grown up in Malibu, that's what this guy looked like. So Malibu <laughs> Trotsky is <laughs> yelling over, I, I mean, I'm, he's yelling over everything I'm trying to say. And to my absolute astonishment, I just got serene. I mean, I went past calm into just kind of the Zen tranquility, you know, and and I just let him go and let him go and go and go and go and go and go. And people would ask me questions, a lot of antagonism about the questions, and I'd start asking people about trying to find what we have in common, and they'd be agreeing, they'd be nodding. And I think Malibu Trotsky looked around and said, well, he's actually having a conversation with these people that I brought down to boo him off the stage. And then he started criticizing me, you and your effing long answers, you know? <laughs> and what is it with all these long answers? You and your explanations. Yeah, you and your explanations for your behavior. It's. The, the, the big breakthrough for me, and, I, and from, from the time I've been doing progressive uh, events, I don't do many of them, I've probably done six or seven colleges, 
is that I thought I would go in there and I thought that my mission going in, I didn't think I'd change anybody's mind, but I thought at the very least my mission is to go in there and explain these principles in such a way that people can understand them. Just give it to them the way it is, not, not the way people tell them. I don't Tell them what I think, not, not let them hear what other people think that I think. But I found out very early in all of these cases that my primary um, result was that by the time it was over, people said, well, he strikes me as a human being anyway, you know? He, he, he strikes me as a human being. I, he's a conservative, so obviously he wants to see poor people just dying in the gutter. Right. Um, but he, he strikes me as, as, as a person that doesn't want to see people dying in the gutter, and it turns out I don't. And so this moral preening that causes catastrophic events downstream is the one thing that I have genuine hatred for, mm -hmm. is when people will will puff themselves up about taking a position that's one thing but when you puff yourself up about all the good you're doing when in point of fact the downstream effects of that are catastrophic murderous ruinous dead people ruin lives and you don't want to look at that you want to you want to instead just have the good feeling of feeling like you're doing the right thing that's when i get religion yeah well that's that what a perfect way to end that sentence because it's an odd moral position that they've put themselves in the same way you know we've we've said this on the show a bunch lately but this this progressivism has become a secular religion in a lot of respects and uncoupling that or at least dealing with those people can be tough and i think maybe where you've probably made some headway and i think where i've made a little bit of headway is that if you keep pushing the ideas of, well, I'm for your liberty, I'm for your freedom, I'm for you to live your life the way you want, but then that comes with having other people live their lives the way they want. I think you can get a little headway there, but, but it, it is tough. It is tough for sure. Well, fortunately, we're recording this, so you can take this out and post if you want to. I don't want to take out, nothing. No, in post. I don't want to out you here, but I mean, I look over to the control room, and, there, and there's an American oh, and there's an American flag in the back. We got a big American flag. Big, yeah, a big American flag in the back. That's vintage for like you know. Something well, it's beautiful. With, thanks. But here's what that tells me: seeing that flag in the background tells me that you love this country, and that you, and that you care about this country, and that you would like for the citizens of this country to have the most optimal outcomes they possibly can. Now, what, how we get there is, is the subject of discussion. <laughs> there lies the road. But your motivation, from my value set, your motivation is, is the same as my motivation. So I, don't ha so I could talk to you all day about all kinds of things and not ever get heated about it because, I could get excited about it, but never angry about it, because I, I perceive your motivations to be the same as mine, and I try with all my might to make sure that my motivations are are worthy, you know, that they're that they're decent motivations, that they're that they're not selfish or they're not exclusionary or they're not any of these things. They're 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 things that you could answer for and and not have to blush, you know? So you're telling me that as a Republican and someone on the right, you're not an evil, racist, bigot, homophobe, Islamophobe, give me a couple other phobe, arachnophobe, uh, et cetera. I, I made the case before and and I'll just give it to you as an example here. I genuinely think, I, I, I was, uh, one of the things they, that they uh, yelled at me a lot about in that university was that I'd said that Black Lives Matter is not a serious movement, and that I cared more about black people's lives than the Black Lives Matter people do. Now that's a provocative statement, I understand that. But the data for 2014 shows that the total number of black homicides in the country, of the total number of blacks killed in this country in 2014, 4% were by policemen under any circumstances. It's not. 4% of the hands up, that's 4%. Shooting a police officer, death, death by police officers, 4%. And when you have a political movement that is, that is determined to make, not, it's not just making a molehill out of the 4% because there, there is some signal in there, there are some bad cops, those, that, that's a legitimate point that needs to be raised. But when, when everything you do is about this 4% of your problem and 96% of the problem, you're not only ignoring, you're suppressing and when somebody points out to the fact, hey, you know, you're putting all this effort onto 4%, most of which is not even up for discussion, you know, it's a gunfight or something, mm -hmm. and you're leaving 96% out here, that tells me you're not a serious movement and I want to know why. And then you look at things like Detroit's been governed by Democrats, uninterrupted mayors and city councils for 60 years, Atlanta's like 138 years, something like this. You, it takes courage, and I don't mean to blow myself up over this, but yeah. it takes courage to say that if somebody has to point this out, that somebody has to point out where the problem really is. And I know what's coming for me when I say that. Mm -hmm. You know, I know it. But it has to be said because people are getting killed and they're not getting killed where we live here in 
Santa Monica. Uh, <laughs> or Irvine. Or, yeah. Uh, Somewhere. Th this is not where the problem is. Yeah. It's easy to talk about these things, and it's easy to put a bumper sticker on your car and hold up a sign and protest all the rest of it. But meanwhile, every week in Chicago, five or six people are being killed. They're mostly black people. They're being killed because of these policies. They're being killed because of all of the economic decay, all of the graft, all the corruption, all of it. They're people dying, hundreds of them every year in every one of these major cities. And that's not an accident, and it's not a coincidence. So... Okay, so I get it. So you're 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 putting your ass on the line. I mean that that's what any of us that are that's willing right. to to take unpopular positions do. So you're 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 putting your butt on the line to say something like that. When you've made headway with people, have you been able to get someone to go, "Wait a minute. That if Atlanta has had democratic mayors for X amount of years or Chicago or wherever, and this is where all this crime and murder is happening. This is where people are not moving upward and all that." Uh, how, how have you been able to to reach people on that? Because it because it seems like it's almost like it's almost the reverse of reason in a way. Because people are just they just hold that belief. They just hold a belief that somehow it's the evil Republicans or something that are that are doing this. It's this is this the racist mm -hmm. uh, Let me let me just go just a slightly off to the side of that because I think the best way to answer that is is like this. When I realized that people wanted to read what I was writing, it was just on a blog and stuff. Uh, and when I started to do actual political commentary. It became clear to me pretty early that I, I had thought I, my job was to change people's minds, was to convince them of things. But very quickly, after having gone to a bunch of speaking events, I think this is different for conservatives than it is for liberals. I realized that a requirement that superseded changing people's minds was I had to, I had to pass ammunition to people who, and, and not just ammunition, but comfort to people who'd been under fire for a long time. That, that my primary job was was to was to remind people that we call conservatives in the country today that they're not nuts, that they're not evil, that they're not all of these things, and provide the evidence that that is the case. Hmm. So I realized early that while it would have been nice to be a diplomat, uh, mostly my job was to go up and down the line and hand out ammunition cartridges, you know, and 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 stop people from being so filled with despair because it, I don't think it's accidental, but even if it is, one of the things that that. The, that is applied against conservatives is this cultural idea that you're a dinosaur and, and you're all these horrible immoral things and that's the entire purpose because if we start arguing you know you're in trouble so there are a lot of people out there and and what the comments I was getting were not so much you changed my mind but Bill you finally put words into what I've been feeling my whole life and you finally allow me to talk to somebody at the you know the water cooler or whatever you've given me the arguments I knew these things were true I just didn't know how to express them mm -hmm. and that that became my primary motivation. Now, if that is your motivation, you're gonna take a different rhetorical tack than you are if you're actually gonna try and convert people. And I would like to be in converting people mode. But I felt that, I felt that, that, the, that the left needed the same kind of ridicule that the right has been getting the whole time and because I'm a former, I was never what you'd call a progressive by any means. I always left the country, the military business, all the rest of it. But I, I voted for, my first vote was for Walter Mondale. Wow. And it was because he said he was going to raise taxes. Huh. Yeah. So you've, you've, come, you've come a long I've way. Come a ways. So to speak. And, and this is not an effort to indicate that people who don't hold my positions are wrong. But I can tell you what interests me the most is... I cannot believe, looking back on things, how passionately I believed in things that I knew nothing about. Nothing. Yeah, that's almost the key to being really passionate about things in a way. Well, you don't know that much about them. I, really I suspect that's to, not true. I suspect yeah. that as you've gotten uh, as you've gotten more experience and more enlightened, me too. I find that the the, the truth that the pachinko balls of, of 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 events tend to fall where they're where you expect them to fall. And I personally, now this is more of a conservative statement. But I personally like the ability to say one thing and then do the same thing. I don't have to call for higher taxes and then tell my accountant to take every deduction that he possibly needs. You know, I I, I don't have to do any of that. Right. And Which that, you're saying that's probably what most progressives are doing. Certainly, what most celebrities are doing. Yeah, right. Of course. I mean, Matt Damon says, "Oh, we should raise taxes," and I'm I'm rich, so I'll pay the highest percentage of taxes. Okay, Matt. But first of all, instead of going home with 13 million, <laughs> you know, you go home with 10. But there are people who are struggling and so on. And you're pretty much, we know you're going into your account and saying, of but, course. But, but, yeah. but Matt, I know, and you know, they don't know, that 
that Paramount doesn't write a check pay to the order of Matt Damon $12 million. They write a check that says pay to MD Enterprises, LLC, right. $12 million. And then the business pays for your house, your car, all your travel, everything. They give you enough money to, you know, to, to, to go grocery shopping on and so on. And you pay tax on that. Yeah. And so this is the essence of it. Uh, I suspect you don't have a problem with that, actually. You I don't have, have a problem with You have a problem with the hypocrisy. Of not, course. Not the, no, 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 of course right. not. Of course not. I right. don't have a problem with that at all. Yeah. They're taking about half of what I make half and and here's the thing um and this is very enlightening uh having uh somebody you love very much from russia because uh natasha would say to me she'd watch me writing these checks to the irs she's saying what are you getting i said what do you mean so, well in russia we have you know free health care we have free college we have free housing and basically all these things paid for by the state and they take 25 percent of what we make and i was a little embarrassed about that <laughs> but what, what, the kind of things that really affect me are, I try to put myself in other people's shoes, and I know, I know a lot of people on the left think that, that people in business are very rapacious and people in government are very kind. But I look around at the condition of the roads, for example, in Los Angeles, and I think about the amount of money that's being spent, and it seemed to me that if these were kind people, the roads would be in great shape and the public sector retirement benefits would be quite small. Yeah. And Just to really personalize that, this tiny little road that separates our two studios is an absolute dump. It's third world. It's, and, I and, mean, it's a dump. The, the exit that we're off of yeah, yeah. over here is, no, it is. is and, literally a dump. And, I mean, and, there's garbage everywhere. And, and my fiance is, is, is shocked by it because like everybody else in Russia and everywhere else around the world for that matter, you grew up with America. America is the land where the streets are paved with gold. And she sees all this garbage on the streets in Los Angeles, and she's quite struck by it. Yeah, it's so interesting what you said a moment ago about you mind if you I just were, knock no, this back? <laughs> that's vodka, by the way. There's Is a real really? Russian theme here. There. Sweet. Is it really vodka? <laughs> it's not really vodka. Oh, uh, but uh, the fact that you were pouring either way says a little, <laughs> says a little something about your Th character. Thank you very much. Um, th there is a little MDMA in there, though. A so, little what? A little MDMA. That's, that's the technical term for ecstasy. Is that right? Yeah. Sweet. Enjoy. I like what you said there that you were sort of, even almost accidentally in a way at first, giving conservatives a, an ability to be okay because they had been under attack for so long, so that you gave them room to go, all right, I'm not so bad or I'm struggling nuts, with this yeah. or whatever it is. And I think in a weird way, I've sort of maybe accidentally partly and maybe not so accidentally, I've given liberals some cover that are going, wait a minute, something's wrong on the left. And I've just given them a little bit of room to go, it's okay to have some conversation. So I love that, that we kind of, from different political places, different political homes, the ideas of just talking about ideas was, was given some room. And as we said on my show, um, I, I, I'm 100% certain that you and I could sit down and uh, over some more ecstasy water, we could probably, <laughs> uh, we could probably write a political platform that 85% of the country would get behind. I mean solidly get behind, 85% of the people. So, so that's a good segue to, to Cruz, because you mentioned that you were a Cruz guy. Mm -hmm. Now, I am a, I'm a constitutional guy. I want us to be governed the way that the Founding Fathers set up. I believe in the branches of government. Mm -hmm. I don't like all the executive actions. People know my thoughts on all of this stuff. My feeling with Cruz was there was something just slimy about him. That's and so I funny. couldn't And I couldn't get over it. And I, in retrospect, maybe I was wrong. I, I don't know. Uh, but I couldn't get over that sort of used car salesman thing with her, with, with, with her, with mm -hmm. him. Um, now, ironically, we, we have Trump now, so it is what it is. But in terms of, is, was Cruz basically your guy, like that you thought this is the guy that is defending all the principles that I believe in? Yeah, there's a lot. Very, I'll, I'll run this very quickly. Uh, one, one of the reasons that I was a, a Ted Cruz fan was because I met Ted Cruz personally before I ever saw him on TV. Mm -hmm. And I remember very distinctly thinking this guy, this would be early, 2010, 11, something like this. Mm -hmm. um, I said, I don't know if this guy wants to be president, but he'll never do it because he's just too nice. Hmm. He's just way too nice for this. But and I, then, th I thought Trump said that everybody hated him, that the whole Senate Cruz, hated him. Or something. Well, I have no doubt that they do, but he, he's also standing up for some principles, and that's not something the Senate's known for. I guess if the uh, Senate hates you, you're probably, you're probably in pretty good shape. Day, yeah. but, but I really liked him very much, and, um, and I had a couple of, of contacts from him about helping a little bit with the messaging on the campaign. And, and, and essentially I said, listen, can we be crystal clear on this? I don't, want to, I don't want to be helping 
to show you how Ted Cruz should be acting on camera. I want to be showing you how Ted Cruz should be not acting on camera. <laughs> please, please, can we not just go out there to his house and spend an hour with the cameras rolling and get all the official stuff out of the way and get down to the guy who's actually there? And but I hear this from many, many, many people, and I never particularly, I, I could see it sometimes. Yeah. I could see it. And my feeling was, well, you, you got to run right at this. You don't run away from those weaknesses. You got to run right towards it and get, get in front of it and explain it. But I liked, um, I liked a lot about, about what Ted was doing. And I have to tell you, the fact that Ted was born in Canada bothered me enormously. I mean, but, and, and this may be justification, but I think it's actual realistic justification. Not to get too far in the weeds with this, mm -hmm. but the requirement for the president was a natural born citizen. And the definition originally was that you would be born in America, exceptions were made for people who were born before we became independent for the first 50, 60 years. Sure. But that you had to be born in the United States or United States territory of two American parents. And the reason was that they did not want an undue influence on you in regard to one of the countries. And, and now having spent so much time with somebody from Russia, I certainly see things about the Russia situation that I'd never seen before. I don't think it would influence me in my ability to make a decision, but it certainly opened up things there. Now what has absolutely influenced me and prejudiced me, I think is a fair way to say it, is that my mom is a British subject. And and I have a very strong affinity to England. My grandfather was Order of the British Empire, and so, so that aspect of it does bias me. And I can see that that was a reasonable re requirement. Now, Barack Obama was not, there's no discussion about, I'm not gonna get into the whole legality thing, obviously, but he was not a natural born citizen by the definition of that because no one's disputing that his father was Kenyan. When they ruled that, that this was essentially okay, then I said, okay. Wait, wait, he, he was not a natural born citizen by the, by by the, the strict, definition? By the strict definition of it, the, 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 the original definition of it was two American parents. By the way, I, I did a quick little thing where I said, um, let's imagine a four-way race between Barack Obama, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Bill Whittle, and, um, <laughs> and uh, Jesse Jackson. Which one of these is qualified to be president? It's Jesse Jackson. Barack Obama has a Kenyan father. I have a British mother. Um, Schwarzenegger was born outside the country. According to the strict definition of it, mm. now, look, it is what it is, but when a standard falls, it's fallen. You can't unbreak it, it's, it's down. And it's like the filibuster thing with the, the nuclear option. There was no Senate rules about it. It was, it was comity, which is nowadays mostly comedy, but it was comedy, <laughs> yeah. it was manners, it was a gentleman's agreement, it was, it was honor basically is what it was. Yeah. We're, we think it's important, so this is a tradition we've had for 150, 200 years, whatever. Harry Reid decides he needs a vote, so he uses the Harry Reid option, and it's gone. And I do have many supporters who say, well, we can't play that way, we gotta hold ourselves to a higher standard. My response to that is no, no, you cannot do that. Once, you have to fight the way you're being fought. And if that's the rules that they want, that's the rules that they got, and they're gonna regret it. So there are videos, 100%, when I was on the Young Turks, a, pro a progressive network, mm -hmm. at the time when they pulled the, the uh, nuclear option. The Reed Harry, option. What's that? The Reed option. The, yeah, okay, so uh, when Harry Reid did this, and I was saying that I was not for it because you cannot change these rules and then expect that it won't bite you in the ass or something, and I don't think they expected it to bite them in the ass only, you know four years later or whatever it is. Um, but yes, you have to have principles yes. when it's hard to have principles. Yes. That's the point That's exactly right. Principles. And when, when we were talking so much about the email situation and the insecure, uh, <laughs> the insecure server and the insecure server, yeah. <laughs> um, it, was, it was a pretty nice machine really. It wasn't, wasn't as beat up an old machine as they, as they claim it was. Uh, but, but people would say to me, oh, so you're telling me that if, if Ted Cruz had done the same thing, you would, you, would, you would have a problem? If Ted Cruz had done that, I'd want Ted Cruz in jail. I'd want him in jail more than I want her in jail. These are standards and these are principles and, and these don't change. Now you may not agree with them, but they're consistent for me and they're important. And if it turns out that somebody who I've been supporting has been breaking the law, I want that person in jail. I want them in jail more than I want somebody on the other side in jail. So does this all feed to why you were so happy on election night because of that, as Andrew described it, the truck that ran through the media or as I've described it, the, the chessboard that was thrown in the air or whatever your metaphor is. Um, because when the Democrats do some of this stuff, like 
crushing iPads with hammers and bleach bidding mm -hmm. computers, things that the Clinton campaign did or colluding with Donna Brazil, which was so obvious that it was gonna happen. I had tweets about why is CNN hiring her from back in 2013. Mm -hmm. I'm not Kreskin over here. Um, you know, it was pretty obvious that these things were gonna happen. So does that explain why you were so happy that night? Because the double standard. Categorically, and that's the only reason I was happy. People so that I, I just I think we shouldn't diminish that because it's so interesting. You weren't a Trump guy. I would suspect that if you were if you're a real constitutionalist, as I expect you are, then you must have all sorts of fears about Trump that he could, you know, take too much power and too many executive orders and all kinds. I'm not of stuff. so much worried about that, to be honest with you. My primary my primary problems with Donald Trump is I find him embarrassing. There are things he says and, and does that I find embarrassing, but that's the price that I willingly and knowingly went into and was prepared to pay. Um, now, for those people to think that, oh, everybody, all the conservatives are always complaining about the media bias, just as a quick point, in 2014, Evan Thomas, when he was a, a, a managing editor at Newsweek, said that he thought that press bias in 2004, I said 14, in 2004, he said he thought that press bias for John Kerry and John Edwards was worth 15 points at the poll. Now, that's John Kerry, that's not Barack Obama, mm -hmm. that's not Hillary Clinton. So I took a look at the Electoral College maps of 2008, 2012, and 2016, and I took 15 points away from the Democrat. <laughs> and the entire country is red. Obama wins Delaware and D.C. or something, or he wins Hawaii, Hillary, Hillary wins Delaware. It's all red, all of it. And as a, just as a rule of thumb, that's how the country would vote if the media was unbiased. Now this needs to be said because I never bring up the subject without saying it. Many people think that I want a conservative media. I don't want a conservative media. I want a fair media. If we had a conservatively biased media, we would then fall into the exact same errors that the left falls into because we'd have the ring of invisibility, right? The ring. You know, you're a Star Wars guy. I'm a Star Trek guy, but yeah. we probably both love Lord of the Rings. And, yeah. and Andrew Clavin pointed this out. What, what the press bias does is it gives Democratic politicians the ring of invisibility. They know they're not going to get caught. And so when people have a sense of invisibility, they do things that they would never do otherwise. And this is why when sometimes in Mardi Gras or something like that, when people are wearing masks, they'll perform behaviors that would never, ever enter their minds because they don't feel directly responsible. And this is the great failure uh, of, of the modern age is that I want a press that is looking 24 hours a day to find out whether there is impeachable information on Donald Trump. I want them looking all the time constantly to see if Donald Trump is colluding with the Russians to see if these impeachable offenses are there. But I would also like that done for Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. And I don't want them to suppress a story, not just not cover it, just suppress it. Because then you've got an autoimmune disease, Dave. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if if it turns out that if it turns out that the press's job is to go through the human, uh, go through the political bloodstream and 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 attack pathogens and destroy them, if it turns out that it's not doing that, but is in fact a way that ideology and pathogens are coming into the system, you got a country's got AIDS. It's got intellectual AIDS. The the mechanism designed to defend us is now the mechanism that is in fact bringing in the 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 contagion. Is it too late to fix that? Have we already crossed the threshold? I think you said, I think I've quoted you on this show actually, you said that night, or maybe, maybe I said, now I've said it so many times, I'm not sure who said it, but I, I'm gonna credit you for it, that it got to parody that night, that the online media and the mainstream yeah. media got, I honestly can't remember which one of us no, said was it. it I, was it you? Was I'll it? just, uh, you just assume it was me, I'll assume it was All you. right, fair, somebody in this room fair, said that, it. That, that seems reasonable. And, and, uh, if I have said that publicly, I'm pretty sure I've credited no, it. Well, <laughs> same, same for you. But I think it's probably just one of these convergent thoughts, you know, where you realize that something's happened. Um, so is it too late to change it? The, there's good news and bad news. The, good, the bad news is, is it too late to change it? Yes. yes exactly. The good news is, is it going to change? Yes. And I know that sounds paradoxical. The mainstream media and the entire media complex in all of this is so heavily invested now, they're pot committed, they're in. They've got to play this card, to the, they've got to play the hand to the, to the end of the game. And it is so massive that you can't change it. But the good news is you don't have to. Because for the first time, and, and it's not just our civilization's collapse, by the way. I, I started writing about the collapses of civilizations. What kind of got me into it is my love for history. And I kept wondering, why do civilizations collapse? They, they, there's a struggle, struggle, struggle. And when they finally reach dominance, you know, when Rome finally defeats Carthage and there's nothing left, and it should be off they go, they just collapse. 
And I think they collapse because the, the elites get bored. But this is the first time in history when common people have had the means to actually influence other common people mm -hmm. in large numbers and circumvent not just the priesthood of the, of the churches or the media or the politicians, but just talk directly with each other. And that, I think, is our saving grace because now there's 160 million people walking around with high-definition television cameras in their pockets. And they've also got news vans in their pockets that right. send up the big mast and the big radio because I can... I can uh, Facebook Live an event, and now we're in the world of absolute truth, right? Once we get video, we're out of the world of what you think and what I think. There it is, you know? Pixar, it didn't happen, right? I mean, there it is. You can't, you can't argue with seeing it there. Is the inherent risk of that, that the system will have to fight back even harder against sure. us now? I wouldn't so call that, that a risk. It's, it's, it's the inevitable it's, consequence of it. Yeah. Where do you see that going? Because I, I, I do worry about that. that I do too. The more that people that, you know, I find that I can get more honest conversation out of listening to you or listening to Joe Rogan or Phil DeFranco or Sam Harris or plenty of people that are, you know, online people. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and I turn on CNN. I mean, I jokingly said to you in the green room, I put CNN on for you because I know you love Thank that you CNN much. there. Uh, but I watch it and, it and it seems like pure dribble. 18 heads all babbling on who got everything wrong before the election, now telling you everything that's going to happen six months from now and all of this nonsense. And it just seems like it's, it's archaic in its whole machinery. I mean, the amount of money that it costs probably to do one night of Anderson Cooper probably would foot the bill on literally a year's worth of my show. Yeah, that's right. I, I don't think I'm being sarcastic no, when not I at say all. that. I, uh, so do you fear that monster sort of hitting back in whatever that, whatever that means to you? It's done the damage it's going to do. It's, it's, it's done the maximum amount of damage it's going to do. The world is changing. You can feel it in the, yeah. you, know, you taste it in the air or the water, whatever yeah. they say at the beginning of the of Lord of the Rings. I got a chance to meet a guy I like very much, admire very much, named Mike Rowe. Um, and I'd love to get him on um, the show. He's a wonderful man. He really is. Yeah. And, um, and he said, I said, I saw one of these things that you just did the way I heard it little. He, he just sets up a, a laptop in his, in, his, you know, in his kitchen. And he said, yeah, that thing got 7 million views or something. When I was doing Deadliest Jobs at Discovery <laughs> Channel, if I had 300,000 people watching a show, I'd get, I'd get flowers from the network. Yeah. So here's why, I, you know, maybe good to go back to what you started with. Why, why are things so acrimonious? I think they're so acrimonious now because what, what is what is not being seen underneath all the Trump, Obama, Trump, Obama, Hillary, blah, 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 underneath all of this, way underneath it, is human beings are going through something that, that's only ever happened twice before in all of human history. We, we are straddling an, a worldwide fundamental change in how the world is built. You could make the case with so many wars and empires and governments and so on, kings and so on, battles, that the only things that have really happened in history is the invention of agriculture, the industrial revolution, and the information age. And when we talk about things like our cities being these murder pits, it's not an easy problem to solve. The reason the cities are murder pits is because the jobs are going. The reason the jobs are going is because America is now fully in the information age and industrial era jobs have gone to where they're less expensive. This is a fundamental problem. This is the same problem that farmers had to face 400 years ago, mm -hmm. where farmers were saying, well, we can't, we can't feed ourselves. Yeah, you gotta go work in a factory in the city. And they didn't wanna do that. And, and so it caused tremendous upheaval. But that's what we're seeing. It used to be that you could, that you could get off a boat and walk through Ellis Island, come out on the other side, and get a job in a factory. I mean, no disrespect to factory workers whatsoever, but essentially an assembly line job meant that. Your job is to take this, uh, this, this bolt and, and tighten this bolt on in this location. And essentially anybody can do that, mm -hmm. anybody. So, so industrial era jobs being relatively repetitive gave people who were hardworking and, and, and oftentimes very smart, but people who were new here, people who needed a chance to get started, gave them a chance to do some work and get some decent jobs out of it. And Baltimore, for example, Baltimore, for a brief period there, the neighborhoods were, were they were integrated. They were, they were people who'd been there for quite a while, a lot, of, a lot of black workers coming up from the South after the war. But everybody was working at the factory. Everybody was working hard. Everybody had a vested interest in making their yard look nice. Everybody was going to more or less the same churches. They were hanging out together. Didn't last very long, but it was there. And it was there because, because the economic opportunities were there. And it's not like some company decided, hey, you know what, we make more money in China. That is, in, in fact, what happens. 
but it's it's a fundamental enormous enormous change and you can't get people into the information economy as easily as you could get them into the industrial economy it's interesting to me because we're obviously undergoing something absolutely massive right and now stressful. and stressful it's stressful yeah it's stressful a lot of my direct messages lately have been about that stress just don't let politics make you crazy try to escape and breathe every now and again and do some stuff you yeah. enjoy hopefully and whatever else um, but it also shows why easy answers are never the correct answer. No, they never because are. I was in Seattle last week, and you know they've had this. Uh, they push for the fifteen dollar minimum wage all this time, and I can, I'm not an economist, but I understand that I don't see why you should be able to tell a private company how much they should be able to pay their employees. Blah blah blah. I get off the plane in Seattle, and the McDonald's in the Seattle airport. You know what they have instead of workers? They have automatic kiosks. They have iPads. Pretty soon they'll have. Pretty soon they'll have hamburger flipping machines. Yeah. And that's because this is, the, I think this is the fundamental difference between the two camps that we call liberals and, and conservatives today. I'm sure there are people going to find this a, a self-serving explanation, but nevertheless, <laughs> here it is. I believe that liberals would rather feel good about things even if they do harm, and conservatives would rather do things that made sense even if it made them look bad. Your example of the minimum wage is a perfect example. Everybody would like people to make $15 an hour. And, and, and I, I, this, if healthcare were free, I'd be in favor of free healthcare. Right. What kind of an animal would I be? <laughs> no healthcare for you. I don't like the way you look. Your skin's a little dark for me. No healthcare for you. Off, go off and die in a ditch. What, I would be the kind of person that people assume I am if it were free, but it's not free. So since it costs money, we have to figure out how to pay for it. We have to figure out how to pay for it means things like competition. All of a sudden, you're you're a conservative again. So this is the point of it, right? It's it's you can feel good about things. Because everybody else tells you, I'm in favor of, of uh, I support, uh, I've got a bumper sticker on my Prius that says free Tibet. See? See how? See how? Because <laughs> I, I, I care about you Tibet see. and I'm deeply concerned about the, about, the, about the people of Tibet. And I don't doubt that they are. But if you want a free Tibet, you need a bumper sticker that says United States Marine Corps, right? Or National Rifle Association or something like that. Because that's what it would take to actually free Tibet. Mm -hmm. And that's not a pleasant thought, and, and nobody likes to admit it, and if you had somebody say that, you'd get a lot of grief for it, but it's the reality of the world. And so sugarcoating, sugarcoating the outcome in order to preserve this sense of, of this warm, fuzzy feeling I have about myself, to me is a form of, of uh, vanity and, and, and hypocrisy that I can't afford for myself anymore. Yeah, but we just, as a society, it seems to me we don't have time for it anymore because of the, the change that we're going under right now. There is no time to fiddle around with these feeling things when we're in such a massive time of upheaval. Right, and we're in, and, and we're in, in this enormous upheaval. Um, here, I think this is probably the best way to think about it. Why, why are people becoming so, why are, the, why are the sides diverging so much? Why is it they can't even, we're not even looking at the same news stories anymore? Why is it that half the country thinks that Donald Trump should be impeached immediately and the other half says that CNN's already admitted there's nothing to this story? Why? Why, why can't the two sides hear each other? And, um, you know, the, the word meme before, before it meant a cat with, you know, impact uh, font at the bottom of it. <laughs> yeah. A meme was the, was the idea that a thought could be transmitted the same way as a gene could. It could be passed on, essentially. So I think you can get a pretty good anal analogy out of genetics on this. If you have a population that lives here, and a significant number of people move over there, and now there's a mountain range between them, something happens. When everybody's living together, everybody intermarries, and so they share, they share the exact same gene pool. When people go over to a second location, now these people have the same gene pool as these people, but if they are no longer intermingling with each other, the normal evolution that this group has isn't affected by these guys. These guys have a whole other set of evolution. And what you find is, is you find this genetic diversion. And they'll continue to divert. And they'll divert until they become different species. Because, they're, because the genes are not communicating. We're over here evolving, they're over here evolving, and this split is irrevocable unless you can remix the populations. I think it's the same thing with memes. We basically hear as conservatives, we hear news, we hear stories, we hear interpretations, all of it, that has become part of our mimetic code. And liberals have a mimetic code too. And we're getting very close to the point now where these two things can't interbreed anymore. You know, it comes a point when the species diverge enough so that that's the definition of a species is one that can no longer interbreed with the other. Right. And this is bad. This is bad, bad, bad. Because even though this divergence is happening so much, we're living next to each other. You know? 
These these are not continents that are that are that are going their separate ways. We're literally living next to each we, other. In fact, Sometimes no. I'm in the same room. And yet here we are, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah and yet <laughs> here we are. The divergence is essentially nothing. It's it's essentially nothing. It's ten percent, fifteen percent. Yeah. So yeah. that's the part that I want to start focusing on, and I think maybe for the next year of the show, because I sense that things are going to keep going like this. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm going to try. I think that's what I've been trying to do anyway. But maybe focus a little more on that ten or fifteen percent, because most of us want the same simple things. You know, whether, we, I, I'm, I suppose you're pro-life, right? You know, it's funny, of all the things I am. I was trying to pick an easy I one. I am, oh. but of all of the things in my, um, in my uh, toolbox, that is the one that's the most precarious. That's so interesting to me because I'm pro-choice and I would say it with the most begrudging, unpleasant, I, I just see no option in this case that I, you know, and we can talk about how many months or, you know, if you're gonna not let somebody have an abortion at some point, then does the state have to get involved and all that stuff. But, but even that, that proves the 10% right there, yeah, right? That you're saying I begrudgingly come to this or this I is have the one. I have, I, have the, the, I think the reason the abortion issue is such a hot issue and the reason that so many people do that split go all the way to one side or all the way to other because it does in fact, it leaves you without, there's no middle ground here. Mm -hmm. Um, and and so you have to pick one, and if both sides of the argument make sense to you, because they do, then you have to decide which one has the greater weight, right? And um, I don't have the religious belief that some people do that that um, that drives them to be very very passionate about this, and and nor do I have the complete lack of li religious belief that drives other people to be in the other position. This one is a tough one. The reason I come down on the pro-life side is essentially pretty simple. People say, this is my body, I should be able to write to control my own body. And I say, I 100% agree with that, but it's not your body. It, this, this is different, this is an entirely different chromosomal pattern. You could take a sample from the mother and a sample from the infant, and you would get two completely different people. So frankly, look, the abortion issue is very simple. It can be resolved in one sentence. It won't be resolved in one sentence, but it could be, if you put all the advertising terms away, pro-life, pro put all that stuff away, what it comes down to is, is it a person, yes or no? From conception to birth, is it a person? If it's not a person, then who the hell are you to tell me what to do with, with, with my bodily functions? If it is a person, then it has protections that supersede somebody else's opinion about it, and that's where the entire heart of the issue is. Is it a person or not? And the reason this thing is so bloody hard is because there, from conception to birth, there is no single day or event that happens. There's no switch, there's no, there's no uh, mile marker that gets passed. It is a perfect spectrum of absolute uniformity between a cell that splits in half and a little baby that comes crying into the world. And this is why this issue is such a bear. Right, and that's why, so some people will argue, well, from conception, it's life. And then mm -hmm. some people argue, well, at eight months, you should still be ha allowed to have an abortion. I would say both of those are, are not great, really tenable positions. But then, you know, you can you can whittle this, no pun intended, that you, all the time, you must hear. I mean, just like, I, I did never. it like seven, almost, almost never. I did it like 17 times the last week. Uh, but, but I would say that maybe, all right, if we could, whatever science could get us to where we'd say, all right, for the first three months, you can have an abortion. Again, not because you love abortion, not because you want to have an abortion, but we begrudgingly allow for this. And, and I know women, I know two women in the last year that have had abortions who did not do it lightly. And, and the, what a terrible position to have to be put in, even if... Uh, Categorically. Yeah, yeah. But, but that say, okay, well, for the first three months, you can have an abortion. But then if the government then says, all right, but if the, if the magic moment, whatever you want to call it, is three months, well, now, does and we're not going to let you have an abortion, does the state now have a responsibility? Now, as a small government guy and, and more of a libertarian, you probably don't want the state to have a responsibility. But at the same time, if the state is saying you got to do it, then do we have a responsibility? I would probably argue yes, again, begrudgingly. So and that's why it's, but it's a rich place to have a conversation. A very rich conversation, tragic conversation. There's nobody in this discussion who's happy about this. No one's going woohoo. Yeah. You know, I had an interesting thought about the abortion issue because I, it got to me the question of the, the whole person issue. And maybe this will help people who are who are um, who are on the pro-choice side understand the pro-life position. At least understand it, if not agree with it. I'm certainly not expect them to agree with it, but at least understand it. And and my position, my my thought experiment was this: Whose side were you on in the Civil War? Most people will say the North. As was I, yeah. 100%. Now, the South claims 
that the North launched this war of aggression because they wanted to secede in state rights and all of that, but the reason the South left the Union was they wanted the state's rights and the state right was the state right to have slaves. So let's just call it what it is. Mm -hmm. They left before Lincoln was even inaugurated. If you're a Southerner, your position was, this is my property and they're gonna launch a war and come all the way down to my house and take my property, then of course it's aggression. Of course mm -hmm. I'm gonna fight it, right? The North's position is the same position actually as the pro-life crowd, which is, mm -hmm. that is a living person there and you do not own them and you do not have a right to determine their destiny, therefore, we have a right to go down and free the slaves. We have a, not only a right, we have an obligation. And so now what you find out is that the motivation of the Civil War comes down to a very simple issue. Are slaves people, yes or no? Because if, if slaves are not people, if blacks from Africa are not people, if they're not humans, then they're property, like horses and cattle and so on. The North is absolutely wrong. The war is completely unjust and so on. But if they are people, then the North has the moral right and the obligation to have the government step in on that person's individual choice and protect that individual. That's the fundamentals of the pro-life position, is that it is not, it, is, it's, it has its own unique genetic code, it cannot defend itself, it is no longer subject to your choice. It's a person and, when we're, gonna, and we're gonna protect it. Is it a person, isn't it? How, how do I know? Yeah. We know conception and we know birth and that's all. And because the spectrum is uninterrupted, we find ourselves in this horrible conundrum which puts me against my desire to protect innocent lives that can't defend themselves against the disgusting, repulsive idea that any institution, including the government, gets to tell you what to do and, and when to do it. Yeah, it, and that's why it's such a rich one to talk about and where, where you can sit across from somebody and hopefully not impugn their every motive. Right, and, and, right, you know. and this is where the problem is, right? Everybody automatically demonizes the other side, automatically assumes they're evil. Uh, I suppose I've been guilty of that to some degree. I try to focus that kind of vitriol on people who I am convinced are aware of what they're doing. Yeah. You know, not just people, most, all, virtually all liberals, well, I think m m many liberal policies I consider to be very, poor, and some of them I consider to be downright evil, but I will certainly grant that the huge majority of people who support these policies do so for fundamentally good reasons. They think it's the best way to help people. They think it's the kind thing to do. They think it's the, the nice thing to do. I don't question their motives, um, but the people that are enforcing these policies know what the consequences are in the real world. And those people have a problem with, can I have some more ecstasy water? You, you absolutely can. I'm Thank usually you pretty good about, go, about like pouring camel. the water here. I'm like a camel. You know, it's interesting. I, I would be remiss if I didn't say in, in the course of all this, a few times you, you've said liberals and conservatives. I think you know, I, I consider myself a classical liberal. So just for the sake of argument, when you say liberal, re really you're talking about sort of a leftist or a progressive. Yes, Just, and I hate to get lost in no, the words no, no, and the labels and all that. No, 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 it's critically important. But I know people will be commenting, going, Dick sat there and he was talking about liberals. No, no, critically important. I meant to say progressives, I usually do. Here's the irony of it. Um, you, you call yourself a, a traditional liberal, and I call myself a conservative, and what I'm trying to conserve is liberal principles. I'm trying to conserve liberal principles. People think, what? When People were being held as slaves, I'm a liberal. When women are deprived from holding office or, or deprived from, from jobs that, that, you know, in the same pay and everything, I'm a liberal, I'm liberal on all these things. But when I become a conservative is when this situation has gone too far. And you, well, what do you mean by too far? When equality of opportunity and equality under the law and, and when Martin Luther King says, um, I have a dream that my children will be judged by, not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I'm a big old liberal when it comes to that. But when you get to a place where then you say things like white, that black people can't be racist or that, um, that we need set-asides or that we should hold people to a lower standard or whatever, you've gone too far. Now I want to conserve these principles. I want to conserve traditional liberalism. Classical liberalism is, not, is what many people on the far left would not agree with today. Don't I know it? And free speech <laughs> is number one, right? Free speech, number one. The fundamental idea of classical liberalism is I should be able to say whatever I damn well want to, you should be able to say whatever you damn well want to, and you hurting my feelings is not the same as assaulting me physically. It's My feelings getting hurt by you is my problem, not your problem. And this is a traditional 
core value of liberalism, which conservatives are trying to conserve in the face of these progressives who want people to shut up, and, and if they don't agree with them, then they hit them on the head with a tire lock. Yeah, and that's why I've said defending my liberal positions is becoming a conservative principle. It's, it's that's, just, it's it's just see, how it is. There we go. So there it is. So most everything, most everything, I think, on the table politically could be resolved amicably with things like perhaps abortion being a real sticking point emotionally, but most things could be, I think, resolved pretty amicably. One little example, I was up in Idaho, and uh, I was talking to some, some people there, and it looks like they may be able to do things as a state that we can't do as a federal government. And I said, you know, guys, if you could just explain the Laffer curve, you'd, we'd get what we want, and the, and the progressives would get what they want, too. If we could just show the math that shows that there comes a point as you lower the tax burden, the economy grows at such a rate that by lowering taxes, you increase revenue. Who loses here? Businessmen and, and people like me and conservatives want lower taxes so we can do more, we can expand more, we can do all, do all these other things. But if it turns out that lowering taxes increases revenues and you're against that, that's where I go with these things. I try to go to the moral argument. Why do you hate poor people so much, Democrats? What do you mean? Well, your taxes are so high that you're not getting maximum revenues out of this economy. So if you actually genuinely believe you wanted to help poor people and disadvantaged people, and you need money to do it then you should be in favor of something that brings in more revenues. And if you're saying, no, I'd rather let those people undergo some hardships so long as the rich get whacked, now you don't have the fig leaf anymore. Now you don't get to say, oh, I'm doing this for somebody else. You're doing it out of a sense of envy and, and other uh, venal right. motivations. I, I suspect usually, though, that their argument be, well, we want to take from these people so that they can't get too much so that we can, you know, they have another justification for it. I don't agree with that justification. This is one of the instances, taxes, where I've, I've definitely shifted a little right Ta in the last couple of years. But I, I see what your point is. Taxes, look, this is not an inflammatory statement. Taxes are money that are taken from individuals at a rate determined by somebody else and enforced by law. I think we can all agree on that. It's a relatively fair uh, assessment of it. So. So if your position is, is some people have too much and other people don't have enough, I understand that position. I understand it. I sympathize with the, with the end results that you're looking for. But if it turns out that your personal animosity and your personal commitment, here's the thing. If you really believe that, and it could be shown that lowering taxes increases state revenue, then anybody that's not in favor of that is not talking about benefits for the poor. They're talking about their own envy. They're talking about their own inability to take your eyes off of what somebody else is making. Right, and this, there's no end point. I mean, there's no point where you're gonna go, all right, we've taken enough, now we can yeah, change the system right. and, and do it more equitably. Or, right, or so, so, you know, we hear, uh, you could take a look, at, if you look at if you look at education scores versus money, what you find is the more money we've spent, the worse our scores have gotten, right? And they, it's the argument's always the same: we need more money right. for schools. Well, we pay three or four times per student per student more than the next closest developed country, and our grades are 27th, 28th, 29th. People like me would look at this and say, it's not a question of more money. The more money we put in, the lower our result gets. I would look at it and say the problem with education today is we're getting what we're paying for. And we're not paying for education. We're paying for graduation. Uh -huh. And these are separate things. We have a factory where these boxes, we get paid by the box that comes out of the assembly line. And it doesn't matter if the product in the box is a terrific product or if it's broken or if there's nothing in the box. <laughs> we get paid we by the box. Get it. Yeah. Right, so that's what we're paying for and that's what we're gonna get. But if we decided we wanted to start paying for education instead of graduation, we'd see a whole different set of, in, of, of uh, incentives and then people would do what I think they normally do, which is pursue their best in self-interest with, in, in virtually everybody, a sense of, of understanding that I'm not the only person in this entire country. I have obligations to other people for decency and so on. So you think people might be fundamentally decent? I know for an absolute certain fact that if you and I were to pick, were to pick uh, any 10 people from your audience and 10 people from my audience and put them in the same room, I would bet you it would take us less than three hours to get people to agree that all, f f let's say 10 and 10? Yeah, all 20. 20, 20, 23 of us, 22 of us could write a, could write a plan for. That, that we would, in, if we could get past the animosity, we would find, here's, here's in a nutshell, here's the way I think it, it works. Liberals have a, a, a desire to protect people who are, who are um, underprivileged. Conservatives say yes, but the way to do that 
is is through this mechanism, and this is where the is where the head go mm -hmm. butting goes. This is why I personally am so offended by the racist charge and the misogynist charge and the and the hateful charge and the Nazi charge, because it's not about I don't care about them. I just want as much as I can get for me. It turns out that the way the world is built, the way human nature is built, is that by me getting as much as I can for me is in fact the best way for these people to be helped. This is. The, this is the this is the difference between feeling good and and seeing what seems to be right. Many look. If if handing poor people money stopped them from being poor, we wouldn't have poor people. We wouldn't mm -hmm. have poverty in this country. We said trillions and trillions of dollars have been paid, and we're not getting anywhere. So it's not that. So if it's not that, then what is it? Yeah, all right, well, we've done over an hour here. Now that I know our studios are so close, I suspect right. we will do this again. We'll, we'll set up a, a couple of uh, cans with a string. <laughs> we, can do, we literally could do yeah, it. Yeah, better it's audio that, quality than I have that, at my studio. Than yeah, any. it's that close. But I want to ask you one thing. Mm -hmm. If I didn't say the two words common sense uh -huh. before you walked out of here, I'd, I'd feel bad because uh, your book was the common sense resistance. It's, it's the phrase that your, your tag on your website and common sense. I think nothing that we've done here, I think that for the most part what I've consistently tried to do every week is just bring a little common sense. Sometimes I talk with pretty bright people who are mm -hmm. doing a, a really high level stuff that goes above that pay grade, but that the basics of what most people want right now are common sense. So to, to wrap this all in a nice little bow, what is the best way to just bring a little more common sense into the world right now? I think common sense is derided by people who, who have a vested interest in telling themselves how important they am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't edit for content. No, and, and, and the reason I know this is because I was one of those people myself. You know, if, if life was a role-playing game, I put all my points into intelligence. I just had to show everybody how smart I was. Intelligence was everything, everything, everything. I didn't care about anything else. But the problem with that is, it, it, it makes you think that because you're smarter than people in some area, that you're smarter than people in all areas, and that's just not true. If you were to take, I would suspect that most progressives would think that the way to handle something like the economy would to take the, the 20 brightest Harvard and Yale economists, put them in a room, have them set policy, and then this policy would be determined across the country, legally enforced, and that this would be the smartest way to handle it because they're smarter than the guy that runs the gas station on the corner of the street. And there's no question that they're more intelligent than the guy that runs the corner gas station, but what they don't know more about is how to run a corner gas station. Mm -hmm. That's what they don't know more about. And the idea that we are going to take away from the person who runs the gas station the decisions on how to run a gas station is where we get into trouble. Just because you're smarter than people in some areas doesn't mean you're smarter than people in all areas. And kind of takes us back to that junior samples moment I had where I thought, well, you know, what a, what a, what a cartoon of a, of a, you know, of a rube. And, and then for some grace, I was just lightning bolted into a realization of how repugnant that is and how much more this man must know about many, many things than I do. Once you understand that, you realize that you can't take 10 or 20 processors, no matter how fast they are, and process information faster than you can with 320 million processors working in local information in parallel all mm -hmm. the time. And, and so I think the, the main thing to do would be to get away from this sense of, um, is to get away from the sense that, that, that this country consists of smart people and dumb people, and that the dumb people vote for Donald Trump and that they don't see, you know. The best thing I ever heard about Donald Trump that goes to this common sense thing is, I'm sure you've heard this before, is that the difference between progressives and conservatives is that um, progressives take Trump literally, but they don't take him seriously, while conservatives take him seriously, but they don't take him literally. And that's really it. We know, I know, and most of us know what he is. This, we tried a nice guy. We tried a couple of nice guys. Mitt Romney's probably the most decent man who ever walked this earth in politics. He's a racist, he's a murderer, he's, he's, he's giving people cancer, he's sucking the health care out of the... Okay, okay. Yeah, the you, binder full okay. of women. Yeah. You, want, you want a knife fighter, you're gonna get a knife fighter. Uh, and, and so we can all walk it down. And the main reason I was so happy about coming to do this was I knew this what this conversation was going to turn into. It was going to be an example that people who may have different labels, in fact, agree on virtually everything. And the things that they don't agree on are things that they can agree to disagree on. I'm going to go home and think about some of these things probably in a way I hadn't before. And at the very least, if you can't come to agreement on this, then you can at least understand that the person who you're disagreeing with is not some kind of monster. That's the essence of common sense to me. It's built into the society, it's baked in, it's a texture that's baked onto the wall. And 
we, we, we sneer at that at our peril. Well, let's keep this conversation going. I'd be delighted. We will meet privately at that restaurant I mentioned before. That sounds like a lot of fun. Not at the exit, that's a dump that no. we both probably have to figure out. Okay, how so to now, get our... now 4chan. Yeah. Okay, 4chan now. <laughs> oh, great. 4chan now says, okay, we need, a, we need a real dumpy, um, a fear, and there's a good restaurant within a good, and 4chan, well, that's a whole other discussion, but yeah, they I could say it was a good restaurant. It's just a restaurant. It's not, it's. 4chan will have this address. Oh, in 4chan's all over it. All right, for more on Bill, check out BillWhittle.com.